Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry, and all three of us are professional illustrators, and we've all been working for the last 25, in my case, 30 years. Uh, we've worked with just about every major publisher in the business. We've published somewhere between 50 and 100 books, who knows how many, and we've all taught illustration at the university. Each week we come up with a new topic in illustration and we hash it out, battle, headlocks, and then hugs. And uh, each time you learn something brand new. Headlocks and hugs. That's our, uh, that's our new <laughs> that's motto. Our... <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, give, give each other noogies. Is that what they're called? <laughs> like, you rub, rub their skull with your knuckles? <laughs> well, yeah. When someone's wrong, you have to lovingly show them how they're wrong. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. That's what my job is here. Do you guys know the sandwich <laughs> method? You believe in that. <laughs> do we What's know that? what? The, the sandwich method? You've heard of that? Oh, for critiques, I use the yeah. sandwich. Yeah. yeah. That's like right. Bologna. What yeah, give it? him some bologna. That's Will's uh, main ingredient <laughs> for his critiques. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was perfect. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you start with something nice. It's it's the Oreo, right? You start with something yeah. nice, and then you then you give them a little... <laughs> little pep talk, some little critique that they need to work on, and then you end with something nice. That's a, yeah. it's a it is a tried and true model for critiquing. I think it, it works every time. All right, well, what are we talking about today? We're talking about something pretty cool today, and this was a, a podcast that we promised our um, participants in our critique arena at sbslearn.com. Mm. So this is this is one that we we talked about in a. Uh, in, in Critique Arena, that we were going to do this on the podcast. And do you so, want to do a, a 30 second explanation of what Critique Arena is for people who don't know? Critique Arena, I believe it's two men enter, one man leaves. Or, no, that, 16. No? Oh, 16, 16 enter. People enter, and then two people two. leave. Two people And leave. what it is was, I'm, you know, I, I watch a lot of, I used to watch a lot of reality TV, I, mm -hmm. I used to watch Survivor. I love Survivor. It's a good show. And I thought, how do they get these people to bleed and do amazing things? And most of them aren't going to get any money at all. I mean, they get the, they kind of get a, a break from their life and they get a little bit mm -hmm. of money, but they get a daily stipend. Did you know yeah. that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how, but how do they get these people to just, I mean, dedicate their lives to, to something for this short period of time in their life for 30 days? And, and so I thought we need to do something like that in the art world, mm -hmm. you know, and art, the art world in general is, is kind of stuffy. Mm -hmm. People aren't usually that creative. So I thought, let's do something where, where we compete. Cause I mean, that's really what we're doing in the marketplace is we're competing mm -hmm. with our art. Right. So the idea is to make a bracket, uh, to have a comp to have a, uh, a prompt, an illustration prompt. And let as many people satisfy the prompt with an illustration as they want. This is done through our forums at svslearn.com. And mm -hmm. each month we provide a new prompt. And sometimes it's a really simple one. And sometimes it's it's lengthy. It's Sometimes it's more like a job assignment that you would get. And sometimes it's more of just a one-word prompt, mm -hmm. which which I don't really like that much. But anyway, we do that anyway because some of us like that. Ones. Those yield the better <laughs> results, but whatever, go ahead. <laughs> I think the coolest and, one was that uh, book cover assignment. That one, I don't think that so. Was really neat. But anyway, <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we give the prompt, and and uh, people in the forums do it. And we have often we have over a hundred people that that send us artwork for this, and they they put it in the forums. They they upload it to the forums, and then we take it, and we we look at all of them each month. Uh, the three of us or two of us. Mm -hmm. And then we decide the top 16. And then we let the, the audience, whoever shows up for the live Critique Arena event that we do on our Zoom meeting, we also stream that on Facebook, but we let the students vote. And there's a, there's a voting feature that we can post on Zoom. Yeah. And we do, you know, in the latter, we go through each one and we talk about them and we, we give a little critique on the ones that didn't make it. And then we move on and... And then eventually we we end up with a head to head 
on each side of the bracket, we end up with the top two. So we don't go to the top one. We take the top two, and then those two um, winners um, have the opportunity to illustrate our podcast episodes, and we do pay them a small fee for that. Mm -hmm. So it's like an assignment. Um, real, What's cool real. is a lot of these, uh, because it's a lot of amateurs or, or people who haven't gone pro yet uh, participating, the job we give them to illustrate the, the podcast is oftentimes their first like paying illustration job. Um, and so it's a chance too for them to learn like here's the back and forth, here's how you take art direction, here's how mm -hmm. you provide something. Um, and so like all, every step of the way from taking the prompt, doing your own version of it, posting in the forum, getting feedback from other people in the forum, and then submitting it to critique arena, going through the, the critique arena, like, uh, selection process, like all this stuff, just, um, uh, it, it's sort of like, uh, knocking off like rough edges on your work and on your ability mm -hmm. as an artist until you get to like more polished. And we have these people who, you know, there's people who have been in the top 16 every month last year, like for the for the last year. Um, and uh, and then we have what's fun is like seeing someone new show up that like knocks out someone else who mm -hmm. who maybe would have normally gotten in. And it's fun. It's a competition. If you're if you don't like competitions, it's not for you. But if if yeah. uh, if you like, uh, you know, throwing your stuff out there and seeing what seeing what works. Um, if even if if you don't get picked as a top sixteen, just the act of like sitting down to make a finished illustration to present to someone yeah. um, can change your work more than just um, you know just working in your sketchbook or whatever. Right. I should I should add that you know where I'm not going to give up what this topic is for this podcast because I kind of don't really remember what it is. It's Will's topic, <laughs> but 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 I will say that you know we get to go through. You know, last month we had a, a, over 100 entries. You know, I think we had 110, 115 entries, and so me and Will, or me and Jake, or Jake and Will, we it's always two of us kind of go through all of them, and we pick the top 16, mm -hmm. and it's pretty easy to get you know to the top 50. And then it becomes a lot more difficult. And so mm -hmm. what we what we start to see is patterns. Oh, this is how they most you know a lot of people solved this illustration problem. Or everybody's running into this technical problem, which is what Will and I were chatting about. That was kind of the the impetus for this podcast, right? We right. were seeing some of the same mistakes over, and uh, and I'll, I'll let Will explain more detail. But but we you know once you go through a hundred plus illustrations, you really start to see what tendencies are for students, and it's it's an awesome. Mm -hmm experience for us to, to go through that and see it. Yeah. So this podcast is really going to be a strategy session for people who want to enter the competition or even it's, it's good for anybody who's going to be good. It's going to be good for anybody who makes illustration in general. We're going to keep it general on the advice that we're going to give, but the advice is geared to getting more people into that top 16. You know, mm -hmm. that's been the, Pro that's been a problem for some of the students because then they ask, well, how come the same people are getting picked? And our answer is always, we always want to pick the best. And yes, mm -hmm. it sucks that you didn't get picked and that <laughs> this other person didn't get picked. And you guys have been entering for a year now and you haven't been picked for the top 16. We want more turnover in that top 16, thus yeah. this podcast. So this one's going to be called, uh, this one is called, are there, are there shortcuts to making great art? Uh, another tagline could be, or the, the tagline could be working hard, not smart, you know, mm -hmm. or working smart, not hard because people yeah. are working hard. They're working so hard and we're going to, we're here to help you make work smarter. That's, that's what this is all about. Yeah. So I, like I think I thought first, what we could do is identify uh, from the last one that you and I did Lee, what the kind of the trends and the things that we were seeing that was getting, was getting us to not, I don't know how to say this. They were eliminating themselves from being picked or right. we didn't like them. That's a better way to say it. We yeah, didn't like some, their, there was some identifying thing that was wrong <laughs> specifically. That was easy to point to. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. want to love your art. And there were so many pieces that were so close, but for a few things. So we're going to talk about those. So Lee, what was one of the things that you saw as a pattern? Um, this last I, time. I don't want to get it out of order with what you're going to say, but there's one that I definitely... No, go ahead. This is okay. this can go anywhere. 
Okay, so so one of the big things is using the soft edge brush. Most most pieces are done digitally, uh, but it, you can enter traditional work too. It's not geared just toward digital work, and we don't mm -hmm. favor just digital work. But most people tend to do digital work, and they are using Photoshop with that very soft edge brush and not controlling the edges, so the whole mm -hmm. thing ends up looking blurry. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's soft. a huge problem. And and the thing that. Uh, that we teach in our classes, uh, what you know, and, and I've taught this in design class and and in some of my rendering classes, some of my painting classes. But edge control is really important, and there is a time and a place for that soft brush, and it's in the background if you're going to have soft edges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you have anything crisp or crisper in the background, and then you have softness in the in the foreground, that goes against nature. And so that's going to just look wrong. It's going to look amateurish. It's going to look like you don't know what you're doing. Um, and it's unappealing to, you know, just just straight up unappealing. Uh, I, thought, I thought of an interesting test. If you guys, if you listeners want to see if yours is too soft. Want to see my technique? Yeah. yeah. Getting What's through your this? Test? So yeah. if it's in Photoshop, may just make a new layer on top of everything. And then make a square or whatever shape you want to with the lasso tool, something that's you know one of the selection tools, yeah. And just fill that. And if that looks abnormally sharp, <laughs> sitting on top of your illustration, if I mean, in other words, if you can't find that same edge somewhere in your illustration, right? It's Assuming too soft. that there's no um, feather on that edge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a hard no edge. feather. No feathering. <laughs> yeah. Don't be feathered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 check it because there should be some area of extreme sharpness and then possibly there should be some area of crisp i mean you got you have a a whole um what a bell-shaped curve sort of 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 edges you got sharp crisp firm and then lost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh and 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 just you can kind of look at your illustration even through that lens and say okay how how where's the majority of my strokes mm -hmm. yeah now lee your artwork you have a lot of blurry like painterly what gives? How can you? I mean, you're a hypocrite, right? You're like, oh yeah, no, you have to, you have to control it. See, if I put, if I did that test, there would be a section of my illustration, and it's typically where I want you to look. It's going to be a crisp edge. It's yeah. probably going to get the most contrast. It's probably going to get the most saturation. Yeah. Um, and and then you, I, I love lost edges. I think I think they can make. I mean, it's what makes really good watercolor paintings um, intriguing to me because mm -hmm. people play with that lost edges, but with no sharp edges, the whole thing's a mess. Yeah. Right. Right. Good. Okay. So Jake, anything that you've noticed in general when you're looking at the, the field in the yeah. beginning? Yeah. This is an obvious one and this is an easy fix. Um, make sure your image like is, is finished. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every every month we get four or five of them where they just look like they they petered out and they didn't quite like like finish them. They might not be in color. It might just be a line art thing. It might. I mean, you could have something black and white or line art, but if it doesn't look finished, if it doesn't look like this is this is my. It piece looks like it looks like a study, kind of right. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. so I would say do whatever you need to do to make make sure it looks finished maybe a little polished um and uh and uh, that is kind of broad a broad piece of advice but i wouldn't i feel like i have to say it because we still get these pieces that come in you know half thought through half rendered half drawn out yeah um, and it's it's a, it's a balancing act with that one it's an interesting topic to bring up because you know it depending on how loose of an illustrator you are you may think, okay, I'm trying to go loose. What makes it not seem finished? And like some of the, some illustrators uh -huh. are super loose, and it still seems finished. Like mm -hmm. some of the work that Pascal does, or or mm -hmm. or what comes to mind is like Quentin Blake. If you guys know him, you know, mm -hmm. clumsy ink line drawing on top of clumsy watercolor underneath it, and yet it doesn't look like a sketch. It mm, looks right. like it's supposed to be that way. So it's right. going to require some. Some effort. We had a student in a class one time, uh, me and Jamie Zollers for the book cover class, really struggling with that. His, he was doing everything he could to maintain a freshness, but it always felt like a study. 
-hmm. And we're like, just go ahead and finish it to where maybe it feels too stiff and let's look at it then and maybe dial it back. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we had to play with that whole spectrum because we couldn't put our finger on it. Like, why does this look like a study and this other one look finished? Mm -hmm. Same qualities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too, uh, if you want to go with that unfinished look as your finished look, that is usually done by people who have done a lot of finished work and they know how far to take it and they know how to maybe over render and then they can dial it back. The, mm -hmm. You'll have a much better barometer for, for what feels finished in an unfinished way um, once you've done <laughs> a lot of like finished, finished work. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've seen that with Will stuff. Like you compare um, some of your drawings 10 years ago, Will, or your paintings oh, yeah. 10 years Everything ago. Everything was too finished. Everything was so finished. And you look at now like your little people or your little, um, is that what we call them? Little characters? Um, whatever the little thing those. yeah and they there there's a sketchiness to them you could still see like line line work in there and stuff um there's a yeah. there's a polish to them but but they're you know they're not like rendered deeply yeah and, and it really comes down to i think learning what areas of your drawing or painting need you want people to look at because that's typically where you finish more you know uh -huh. if you look at really good portrait painters Re, you know, or, or really good portrait sketching, you'll 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 see that there's a there's a limited focus. Mm -hmm. You know, where someone might, I mean, and it, and it, and if you, it's hard to see it. I've I've noticed this because I was doing this for a class one time mm -hmm. when I was teaching at UVU, and I wanted to demonstrate this, and I would look at a a a, a drawing of you know a portrait drawing where it had really tight detail in the eyes and nose and mouth yeah and everything else started to fade away to where you, they got to the hair and it was just like scribbling you know yeah and down on the neck where the shirt came in it was just a few little wispy lines right yeah but it doesn't look the whole thing looks when you look at the whole thing it looks crisp Mm -hmm. Because your eyes seeing the crisp areas and it's just generalizing that to everything. What you need to do to really analyze a drawing like that is to cut out a piece of paper, a little window out of a piece of paper and hold it and move it around on a drawing like that <laughs> and see the strokes off to the mm -hmm. edge. And you're like, there's nothing there. <laughs> you know, um, but you look at Sargent. Anyone yeah, Sargent's, Sargent's yeah, a great that's example. That's exactly what I was thinking of. You yeah. know, you look at like the the portrait Lady Agnew. Right, that that portrait where she's like kind of sitting in her chair, um, sort of leaning to one side. Yeah, eyes you could see like a glint in the eye. There's so much detail right there, and then the rest of it, he like he got out his fat brush, just kind of did the fat brush with everything else. Yeah. Right. Um, so if if you don't get anything else from this, what we're saying is, most uh, half the people, half the field are using fat brush only. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. That's right. Okay, Will, what about so, you? So my biggest uh, complaint with what we got is um, based on the concept. And I, when I look at mm -hmm. um, art, I want to be moved by it in some way. I want, I want your art to change me. And I want you to make me laugh. I want you to make me sad. I want you to make me excited. I want you to make me angry. I want you to make me surprised. I want you to do something to me. And half of them, or maybe even, well, more than half probably, I looked at it and it was like, well, it's pretty. There's nice colors. There's nice shapes. There's nice rendering. But it's not saying anything. Mm -hmm. you know, so the, the prompt last time was dragonfly. And, and some people, you know, just drew a dragonfly, just kind of flying. And maybe it had... Maybe it had a maybe it was a character, but it wasn't doing anything important. There's no na no narrative implied, really. It's just yeah, like yeah, just a decorative dragonfly. Now, now keep in mind, there's a place for doing decorative work, and it's it's for it, I would say it's for galleries. It's for people who want to hang your art on their wall and decorate or their for home. licensing. You know, or for licensing, it, it's going to yeah. be a pattern on a, a shower curtain or something like right. that. Now, don't misconstrue that though. You can make decorative work and have it narratively interesting as well. True, but if it's just decorative, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't say that that work has no value. It's just that we're our focus is on teaching people how to do narrative art. Right. 
That's that's what our school, our svslearn.com school is all about, is teaching people how to be children's book illustrators, graphic novelists, comic book I guess book what artists. I was adding is you can use almost any style that you want. And so I don't want you guys to think, oh, I need to draw a different way to add narrative. What Will's right. saying is the content is problematic. Right. And and it can't, like you're rightly, it, it can be decorative looking and upon closer inspection, it's got a great concept going on. Right. So mm-hmm. it both can be true at the same time. Um, but, but so many, um, and I, and I have some ideas here on, on what to do for, for you guys who are struggling with concept. Cause it's hard. If you get a prompt that's like dragonfly, well, what do I do? Well, on the nose is, is basically just draw a dragonfly as a character. What's, what's it doing? Why do I care about that dragonfly? Mm-hmm. I don't. There's, there's, we're looking at over a hundred pieces of art and you have to make me care about your art more than 90% of the others. So how do you do that? The, the easiest way is to come up with something really clever and creative. Think of it as a, an illustration is like, um, it's like a gag in some ways. It's, it's either it's, if, if you're going to go, if you're going to make it humorous, there's gotta be a gag, like a Gary Larson cartoon. Mm-hmm. All right. It, or it could be disturbing in some way in an unexpected mm-hmm. way that is meant to be provocative or in, to anger you. That's tough with children's books, but, but you can do that. Maybe that maybe for comics or, or for, for a graphic novel, um, you can make, you can uh, try to make us as the jurors and, and also your fellow peers. Cause if you make the top 16, those, the, the people that, that vote are the ones that are voting on this thing, ultimately on who's going to be the winner. You have to make them feel something. You have to make them feel sad. Maybe there's, maybe there's an, the, there's something that's happened to this poor dragonfly that we can relate to as humans, you know? So most people did anthropomorphize their dragonfly, which is for children's books. I mean, that's, that makes the most sense. Right. Um, and, but I guess what I'm saying is most people didn't do anything that you know we were able to just kind of flip through and just kind of to run with your example i mean a a, a way that we would go through this is like you start off with the idea okay i I want to do a dragonfly because they're just cool anyway and i want to put a character flying on them okay so that's just step one but a lot of people just literally turned in step one yeah and step two what me and will kept talking about wait stop there lee because that's what we saw how many times did we see a, a kid riding on top of a dragonfly. Oh, it was it was so much, but but you know it was so much. It was a huge percentage of the of the entries. But step two would be, where are they going, or where are they coming from, mm-hmm. and what action are they are they doing? And so mm-hmm. between those three things, you have a huge range of storytelling opportunities. If they're going to a new place, if they're escaping somewhere that's in danger, mm-hmm. um, oh my gosh, they're so. If they're rescuing somebody, I mean, what's doing, the benefit of being able to fly? You know, they, maybe they're pulling somebody out of something. All right, doing something that only a dragonfly can do. Mm-hmm. You know, something like that. Um, maybe there's a community of dragonflies, and you're in their world. You know, or maybe the dragonfly is teaching kids to fly, gathering maybe. something. I mean, there's yeah, so gathering. many. It could it could be anything. The other thing that I like doing too is is taking a, a, a when it's a one word prompt, taking that word and and like disassociating it directly with what it is. So like if I were to take dragonfly, what if dragonfly was the name of like an airship, you know, the mm-hmm. dragonfly, and then design what that airship would look like, or maybe dragonfly was a nickname for like some pirate, right? Right, and some alternate called- kind of use of it. That's great. Right. Mm-hmm. That is such a Jake Parker solution. As well. it is. <laughs> how can I, how can I draw a spaceship no matter what the prompt is? <laughs> You're right. Exactly. <laughs> the other my, thing too, though, going, go, well, can I say one more thing? Going yeah, go back ahead. to uh-huh. just riffing off of what Lee said. Um, yeah. Your characters could always be coming from somewhere, going somewhere about to do something. What, what I like doing is adding either adding in some sort of element to the design. Like what would a dragonfly be carrying? You know, what mm-hmm. What would a dragonfly be like protecting? You know, you take dragonfly and you add a verb to it, right? And mm-hmm. now you've started to get, get a story. And once you have that, 
Don't show them actually doing it. Show the effects of them having done it or about to do it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the dragonfly has a bucket of water and it's carrying a bucket of water and we see there's like a little fairy house burning, you know, or something like that. And we turn, turns out dragonfly is like the fairy uh, fire patrol or something like that. Love it. You know, so it's just, it's, you take the, you take the thing, you add another element to it, you add a verb to it. And then you try to show, you try to let the person make up this part of the story in their mind. You don't show them everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just want to highlight, like just go in that extra distance, that one extra step, like what you're talking about makes it so interesting. Like some people did play with the idea that you were originally talking about, like they played with the idea of dragon fly. So they made a mm-hmm. dragon, you know, they mm-hmm. went the dragon route, but then they just show the dragon. Right. Yeah. So it was just a dragon. Just a dragon, like, oh, that's a clever take on dragonfly. We we want to pick it, but there's no there's no story there. I would do this, and and this is I'll just come clean and say when I was in school, I would come up with an idea for you know, we'd have an assignment for an illustration, which is that's what this prompt is. It's an illustration assignment. Mm -hmm. So I would come home, I was married at the time, and and I would say to I'd come up with an idea and I'd I'd say what I was gonna do to my wife. You know, I was mm-hmm. like, this is the idea for my thing. And most of the time she'd go, hmm, you know, and you know, you can read your significant, right? Uh-huh. You can read the facial features and I would get yeah. mad, you know, I would get all angry and like, cause she didn't like it, you know? Yeah. And yeah. she, and you know, and she had to tell me like, if you want my honest opinion, you're going to have to deal with my honest opinion. Otherwise don't ask. Right. You know what I mean? So my advice is if, you should verbalize your idea before you go and illustrate it to someone mm-hmm. that someone else, or maybe two or three other people and say, I got this great idea for an illustration assignment. It's a kid riding on the back of a dragonfly and then watch the person go. Yeah. And, and what else, what's happening? That's it. That's it. That's all, <laughs> you know? And then that person's going to go, Oh, okay. Yeah. Have fun you know, with that. <laughs> have yeah, fun with cool. that. <laughs> you know, but, but, but it's so much easier to, to verbalize it and realize that you don't have a story than to go through all the hard work. I mean, we looked at these illustrations and Lee and I were both last week or a couple weeks ago, we were like, it's a shame because there's so much work. These people are working hard, but they're not necessarily working smart, mm-hmm. you know? So that's, that's a, that's a tough thing. And we want you to, we don't think that you should have to work as hard to come up with a great illustration. So that's why I've, and I've got these uh, other ideas here and I want to get your guys' ideas too. But um, the, again, the, the topic for the podcast is, are there shortcuts? So I, that's what I want to talk about now is what are people not doing that they could start doing? We've talked about. Well, can I, know, can I add a little bit extra? Yeah, yeah. Just one last thing. There was one little subgroup that would happen that was kind of the opposite of what we were saying in in this in terms of adding story. And mm-hmm. that's where the characters are doing something and we can't make it out. Oh, oh yeah. Right. That's we a good one. We have no idea what's happening. Yeah. We're right. looking around for clues, but. Yeah. yeah. I think one actually won Braden Hallett's image one and we still were like, I don't know exactly what's happening here, but it's drawn so it's rendered so beautifully <laughs> good technique will you know can you know to push it over the edge Some, sometimes uh-huh. an image is just so engaging you don't s- sort of need to finish the details and, say, and then yeah. that's when everybody gets mad because hey you know you're saying that it needs to have a clear story and all this and then all of a sudden one wins and and i guess that's another thing we should bring up is all these are sort of general things you can check off but sometimes you'll have a reason to not add a sharp edge or you'll have an e- a reason to break all of these rules that we're talking about mm-hmm. here. So these are general generalities, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, just having that clear under and, and that all the, really the way to like protect yourself from not being able to understand is show a thumbnail to someone else. <laughs> to anybody. And don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Just show them the thumbnail. Don't tell them what's happening in the thumbnail. <laughs> anybody yeah. with a pulse, just show show it to them <laughs> and get get what they get what they're saying. Um, post it on the forum too. Like uh, oh, people will tell yeah. you, people will tell you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I like where, where this is going, but I don't I don't quite understand what that second character is doing. Um, yeah. And you don't have to do all the work. Uh, you know, some, some of my doing... best, some of my best images were changed by my art directors, mm-hmm. and 
and I still get to take credit, you know, even though, yeah. and, and it's a good I, point. Well, I, some people don't want to do the illustration because they think they didn't figure it out. Right. So they're own. like afraid to post in the forum. I think illustrators need to become a little more humble and realize that like in a feature um, animation film is there's not a single person that, that made that film. Yeah. You know, it's a collaborative e e effort and sharing your illustration with other people that can say, you know, if you switch the angle and you enlarge this and you got rid of that, it might communicate quicker. And that's mm -hmm. what you're looking for is that really quick read, that uh -huh. really quick communication. And if you miss it, it might be that you might have a great idea, but because you didn't pull it off, it's kind of like telling a story verbally. Some people are good storytellers and some people aren't. And there's things that good storytellers have learned to do mm -hmm. that paint that picture in your mind. And that's really what you're trying to do is you're trying to, to communicate quickly through a visual. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. So some of the things that uh, I thought we could, that, that would really help people get better and, and, and have shortcuts is I feel like number one, people aren't the, the, at least like two thirds of the ones that we eliminated. It, it looks to me as if they're not looking at great illustrations, mm. you know, it, it, and and so I have a couple of ideas for strategies. One thing that you could do is you could um, you could take go on our forums or go go on our website at svslearn.com and get the images of all the winners and uh -huh. and go and like Photoshop and make a mosaic of them and put yeah. your work side by side and say and and zoom out and say does mine contrast wise does it hold up mm -hmm. design wise does it hold up. Mm -hmm. Color wise, does it hold up, you know, and then look at the concepts and, and say, you know, concept wise is mine. And with, maybe get with up. that, um, I, I agree with that, but I also like, even when I was in school or, or even professionally, I always place my artwork to around people who are like five steps ahead of me. Right. So mm -hmm. not even just peers, but like, this is what I'm aspiring to, like this right here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think if you like kind of set your bar, you know, a little bit higher, you're going to, yeah. it's just going to level you, you, you know, level you up a little bit more. Um, I totally so, agree. And, and along with that, I would say, um, if you're not doing master copies, do master copies of work. Like f feel what it feels like to make a good illustration. Um. Uh, can I talk about master copies? Yeah. So let me ask you, you two this. When was the last time you did a master copy? In school. School. About a year ago. About a year ago. So I'm, yeah, I'm just I, I do them a lot. I mean, I, I like them. I, I, think uh -huh. they're, I think they should be a constant assignment yeah. throughout your whole life. They're just fun to do. They're, they're fun to recalibrate. And if I'm trying to learn something, if somebody's got a quality and I'm struggling to have that quality, mm -hmm. if and I'm trying to get some of that in my own work i have to do do it as a as a as a master copy and then i write out all the things that i noticed about it mm -hmm. and then i can extract the actual thing that i was looking for sometimes it's quite different than i think um mm -hmm. but i I, uh, I write it out and how it went and, and the edges they're using and the texture they're using and, and different things and and what worked and didn't and then then I, I distill that and then and then it doesn't look like i'm just taking somebody's thing like oh mike mcnola is cool with ink i'm just gonna do that mm -hmm. you know like it's not mm -hmm. like that it's 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 very specific will do you do anything that wouldn't be a straight up copy but are you are you i, I assume in the last 35 years 40 50 years how long have you been working now <laughs> 100 150 <laughs> 100. somewhere there <laughs> like when you're in school with john Seeger sergeant uh obviously like <laughs> wow <laughs> Man, Will went to course. school with the with the Renaissance masters. I mean, he was sitting next to Leonardo. That's really not a render. <laughs> because I, you guys, because I'm like a year older than Lee, I get this only in the only on the piece of paper. <laughs> um, Somebody no, this. but but uh, there, so uh, I, I want to talk about that because Lee does actual straight up copies. Um, I used to do copies like all growing up you know, mm -hmm. and even into, into school. But since then I've done very, very few of them. However, what I will do is put up 
you know, four or five pieces of an artist that I really look up to and like, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try and make something that would have been in their style. Mm -hmm. Right. So how does this guy do hands? Okay. I'm going to draw this new composition, this new character with those same kind of hands. How mm -hmm. do they, you know, how does he control edges or how does, how does he mm -hmm. do, um, uh, you know, landscape or something like that? I'm going to apply it to this. And what that's done for me is completely like, some of those techniques, some of those things I pick up will be folded right into um, my workflow and, and my style and, and stuff like that. I was wondering if, if that's something you do too, Will, or a version of I, that. That's, I, I, I steal other people's compositions, and but I don't do a full co you know master copy mm -hmm. anymore. But I, I'm, I need some freshness in my work, so I look at a bunch of art. Mm -hmm. I look at, you know, I'll go on Pinterest and just, just look for an hour or so, and I'll... I'll grab a bunch of images and I'll say, I'm going to make an image that looks like this, that uses maybe, and I borrow the color scheme from another one uh -huh. and I'll, and I'll, but I do something. Then when I look at it, I can see where all the influences are, but mm -hmm. I've never had anybody say, Oh, you took this from this person and this and this, that's really <laughs> yeah. what art is. I mean, that's really what originality is, is combining. And I feel like, I feel like our students aren't combining enough. I feel like they're, they're working out of their own head too much, you know, and mm -hmm. cr trying to create out of, a, out of a vacuum. And yeah. I did that. I actually thought when I was going to school that that was the best way to be original. I didn't want to look at anything else. Our teachers were like, you should come and see this artist. They're going to be demoing. And I'm like, no, I don't want to see. I purposely didn't go to demos because I didn't want to oh see gosh. what other <laughs> artists were doing because I thought I would end up copying them. You know, I, th I thought yeah. that that's... Yeah. Why do I want to see how they're doing it? I want the world to see how I do it. And mm -hmm. and by default, it stunted my growth tremendously because um, every artist is, every artist's style, when they develop their style, their personalized style, it's an amalgam of everything they've learned from other artists. And that's how, that's how we are. We yeah. elevate each other through our art. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I feel like our students aren't doing that enough. They're, they're. I should. I think. I think you brought up a really good point, Will. I want to just highlight it for a second. Full master copies either all the time. I think when you're going to do a master copy, it's important to do what exactly what you said, and that. Oh, I am wanting a different composition. So now mm -hmm. you're doing master copies with mm -hmm. that focus, and mm -hmm. then you know there's other times you can say, well, I really like how they're using media. I could just take a, a quarter of an illustration and copy that for mm -hmm. media or texture or whatever. It's not like you have to copy every stroke and every line every time, I'll do it, although I do think that's a good thing to do every now and again. Um, if you isolate what the problem is, you can it changes how you approach a master copy. You could just use a pencil and paper if you're just studying different um, compositions and not even do a full painting, you know? Right, mm -hmm. yep. Cool. Yeah. What's the next so one? Uh, another one is, um, you know, it's obvious and it's, you could say it's self-serving to us, but it's taking classes and we offer those classes. And there, I think that <clears throat> I'm wondering how many of the people that are, that we're eliminating so quickly, I'm just curious as to how many classes or how much formal teaching they've had. You yeah. Know? Um, and that's something that if, if you hear someone say, even if you hear hear a teacher saying the same thing over and over again, eventually it really starts to click. And a lot of times you don't understand the in instruction you're getting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. You don't comprehend why the teacher's saying it. It doesn't click. You hear it down the road. You you do some practice, and all of a sudden one day you just get it. And I I can remember so many times going to class, after and turning in an assignment getting it ripped up <laughs> and then mm -hmm. coming out of the class really frustrated, but at the same time going, well, I wish he, that my teacher had taught me this before, which they did, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I needed to have it happen on my piece of artwork right? to really get it beat over my head to go. And then I'd come out going, well, if I did this assignment now, I'd do much better, mm -hmm. you know? So, mm -hmm. so getting, um, getting feedback and taking classes is, I think is really I mean, important. if people, I have a storytelling class that if we required people to watch it and go, I mean, I go through a step by step, there's a checklist that I have in, in that class mm -hmm. on how to make 
art that relates to storytelling. And if our, if we required it, we would get a lot different work. I mean, so to point mm-hmm. to what you're saying, like, like they're not going through those steps because if they even just took that one class, the work would be different. I could point to it and say, hey, I can tell from your image you didn't go through these steps because the stuff's not there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think, too, we, we keep coming back to the storytelling element of this. And um, if you're, you know, if you're wanting to be a concept artist um, or, you know, some sort of uh, fine artist or a, a even someone who does graphic design or, or some sort of illustrative element that, um, that would be used for licensing or things like that. There's room for you where you can create art that doesn't tell the story. And it's just about the visual, like just the design of it is the important thing, but for critique arena, for illustration, for, you know, book covers, things like that, there has to be a storytelling element to it. Otherwise, it's it's just you know it's just an image, mm-hmm. to sh- you know just a window to something else, right? Um, and and that's w- really why we're we're kind of stuck on this storytelling thing is because we are we are all illustrators. We teach illustration. We do il- illustration for children's books, um, and and that's I mean that's really what rises to the top in this in this critique arena is things that have a storytelling mm-hmm. element to them. Not to say that you can't have a portfolio full of cool ship designs. You'll get a job at a video game company, you know, mm-hmm. with that stuff and, and without a single image telling a story. But if you want to become a children's book illustrator, if you want to become any sort of someone who does narrative picture making, you got to get good at the storytelling. Side who's good, who's good at storytelling? You think? I'm mean, just thinking while you're talking, like, who's somebody I'd put on like a top tier for those kind you. of images? Like they're pretty and they're and they're uh, they're narratively satisfying. I, I just immediately thought of Chris Van Alsberg. <laughs> that that's he, what huh? I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> the work is so good. I mean, like you know, you got your Polar Express and and mm-hmm. Jumanji and some of these other ones. But man, the, there's another book uh, that he did called The Wreck of the Zephyr. Mm-hmm. It's just so that's what pretty. I was thinking. Yeah. So pretty, and 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 every image is is so engaging in terms of story, mm-hmm. and so simple. It's not like he's got a. You don't have to hit your viewer over the head with it, right? Yeah. Um. And that's what he was so good at. I think you know that whole black mm-hmm. and white portfolio series he did with these just mm-hmm. crazy things mm-hmm. happening. Um. He's just so good, and and David Wiesner is another person who's I think really good at it. Um, mm-hmm. Carter Goodrich. Uh, oh, I love Carter Goodrich. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think so Tony if, Did- Diderlisi is really good at storytelling too. Yeah, you know, and, I, that got just a little side note. I had a, there was a tweet yesterday with Tony Titrelisi, and I was tagged in the tweet, and I was like, "Why am I tagged in the tweet?" I'm looking at it on my phone, and then I finally clicked on it, and I had a, I had a book that came out last week that I didn't even know about. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's on the it's on the shelf. It's in the shot with Tony Titrelisi's new book too. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'm like, oh god, I need to pay more attention. Yeah, you know, but I I did this uh, awesome. um, illustration recently, and. I can just describe my process for coming up with a story. And it was, I wanted to do, this is what I'll often do. I wanted to create something that's visually appealing because I don't want a great concept that is boring visually because then no one's going to care because the visuals aren't good either, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make this, this, one of those red mushrooms that, that, that grows in the forest that's got the little white dots on it, you know. And I wanted to make it, the house of this muskrat. And then I start thinking, well, why would anyone care about this muskrat and this mushroom house? Sure. It's a, it's a fun looking house, but a lot of illustrators have drawn fun houses in the forest. And so I start thinking about it and I, I start thinking about, well, who else lives there? And, and I start asking questions who lives in this area. Are there, are there friends? Are they, are they more muskrats or are they different creatures in the forest? Okay, so they're different creatures in the forest. Well, what are they doing? Well, the the muskrats working hard gardening. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it's like, well, what's boring is if everything's working, right? <laughs> <laughs> what's more exciting is when things are about to not work well or aren't working well, or and 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 then you think from your life, common experiences as a father raising kids. Sometimes it's really hard to get your kids to 
to do their chores around the house or to clean up and to do the things they're supposed to do. And it's just, just basically drawing from life. I'm drawing our family situation with this muskrat and all these other characters that are doing anything but helping. They're mm -hmm. reading books. They're taking naps. They're playing games. They're riding bikes. They're doing anything but helping. And pretty soon, there's a story there, you know, a story that everyone can relate to. And I got a lot of uh, really good feedback from that um, illustration that I put in my new book. Um, and and that's how I would approach the the prompt is I would write a story, either do it in your head as you're as you're drawing, you know, and asking questions. But really, you've got to write a story about uh, around this this prompt. Now, some some of the prompts are more detailed, and so the the assignment is more fleshed out, and it's going to give you more um, to work with. I and the 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 simpler prompts do, just they make you, if you're going to be successful, you have to write a story to go with it. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, that's, that's the number one thing on this, this podcast. If, if, if our future um, submissions, we start seeing better stories, I'll feel like we really, we really um, accomplished a lot with this because it's just so important. You have to make your audience care about what you did. Um. Another another thing that I um, think that people aren't doing enough is innovating. And what I mean by that is as you're looking at other um, the way that other illustrators solve problems and the other techniques that other illustrators use, are you merely kind of go copying what other people are doing or just doing what comes natural? Or are you formulating opinions and theories about your work. And so, for example, um, I experimented a lot with cubism in my illustration work early on. Mm -hmm. You know, I really kind of fell in love with the cubists in when I, when I had some art history classes and thought, is there a place for that in illustration? And for a long time, I was doing some of the things that the cubists were doing in the, their, in my illustrations. And after a while, I, I started to feel like it was, a distraction to the story that I was telling. So I kind of stopped doing it, but that was a conscious thing that I tried to do. Another thing that I, that I tried to do was experiment with colors in my underpaintings, different colors, and just asking myself, what will happen if I start my whole painting in a cool blue color or a green color versus a, an orangey color or a red or a pink color. And I would experiment with that. Um, I also experimented with really going black on the edges of my images. So everything faded to black <laughs> and that kind of made things a little too dark, but, but I think that, um, I, I don't, I see, um, beginning illustrators, beginning student illustrators. And I feel like they, they they're not, they're not experimenting enough. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Uh, I think that's the dangerous territory, dangerous advice to give because you can, you can, uh, to, to someone who's still learning, mm -hmm. um, cause everything is experimentation at that early stage. Like everything that you're doing is, is experimenting. I think once you've gotten into a groove, like if you're coming at this five years later, um, 10 years later, and you're just like, you're just like, you've plateaued. I would take a step back and look at like, do you need to switch up your palette? Like throw in some crazy color in there and see what that does for you. Do you need to switch up your, you know, your proportions, yeah. like how you, you need, draw yeah, everything? You need, a, you need a good common denominator of way of working and solving mm -hmm. images and then start throwing the variables in. I mean, I mm -hmm. love experimentation. It's kind of the hallmark of how I work now, but I couldn't have done that in the beginning because it just would have been too wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I see your point. Um, it's when you do it, not mm -hmm. not too early on. It's it's hard for me to know exactly how long, when we're looking at the art, how, you know, how. Well, we're dealing we're dealing with the are. wide spectrum, right? They could be right. like a total total newbie, and or they could mm -hmm. be like getting ready to go pro, or even already working pro. Yeah, yeah. So it's a big like if it's a big like. My advice would be like if you're one of these people who has been in Critique Arena in the top 16 like five times and you haven't won, 
maybe take a step back, look at your work. What can you do to punch it up? What can you do to like change mm-hmm. things a little bit? You know, that's great advice. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, I would do that. I would go down that path. You know, there's one but, other thing I remember. I'm oh, sorry, Will. I was just going to say there's one other yeah. thing I remember that we that kept coming up um, mm-hmm. that we would talk about. Do you want me to say that now, or are you on your? On I bet it's. I bet it's what I'm going to end on. So go ahead. Well, what I remembered was they the, uh, a lot of people put a lot of people love doing detail work, but they would put that detail work in the wrong section. And in, in the example that we were using was drag dragonfly was the topic. So they would do these really ornate wings. And then nothing else would have that same level of detail. <laughs> right, right. Super distracting. Well, and that goes to the to the early comment of the limited focus and where Correct. you what you want people to look at. And I think I know the image you're talking about. It was I remember looking at it, we were both going, Wow, these are amazing dragon wings. But why are they? Yeah, there's that nothing, nothing else. We're just so, looking at those wings only. An example that one of my teachers gave me when I was in school was, and he would always talk about this. He'd bring up this image um, of a student who was really advanced and one of his best students. And he did a, a head and hand portrait. You know, the hand was kind of yeah. touching the face somehow, you know. And the hand, I mean, every wrinkle, every hair, every cell fall, you know, cell follicle, every cell in him, you know, just, just, uh, was so detailed. And he's like, that's a, that's a beautiful hand. You, you can't argue the fact that there's, there's master craftsmanship going there, but it's a portrait about this person. Uh What, What is the hand being that detailed? How is that enhancing the portrait of this person? So, uh, so that's it. And my last thing was simplifying. Mm-hmm. We we also, and I think this goes hand in hand, is we saw a lot of images where we're like, it's it's a fun idea. There's a concept there. And it's, um, the, the rendering isn't that bad. There's some good things going on. But it's so complicated. It's not, it's not a well-designed, simplified piece. So a good illustration is like, is like a symphony. I mean, there's, there's 50 things happening all at the same time. Mm-hmm. and 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 um you know and, and we we teach those things in our classes so, you know it's, it's 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 hard to i mean it's hard to do all of them early on and for some people we're probably seeing people that are in their first year of trying this mm-hmm. and i also don't want them to feel like we're beating them up for trying and being in their first year when they're competing against people that have been doing this for five or ten you know what I mean? Can, um, can I give you my formula for making a simple image, even yes. even if it's totally complex, right? I got, I've got a, one too, so I'm curious. There's a hundred <laughs> things going. Okay. even Like this would have even applied to Will's draw 50 things or oh, how many things is it? 50? 50. 50. 50, Im- 50 unique elements in one drawing, right? Uh, objects. Objects, yeah. Um, so my thing is break down the image to three planes. So there's uh, there's a foreground, there's a middle ground, there's a background. One, two, three, just three. And of those three planes, you could have different variants of, com- comple- uh, variances of complexity in them, but they need to initially read as foreground, middle ground, background. And you combine that with light over dark. So light over dark or complex over simple. One of those two things. So make your middle your foreground simple your middle ground complex and your background simple or make your foreground dark make your middle ground light make your background dark or vice versa but just those elements you mix those together you're going to have something that reads super easy Mm -hmm. what's your that's 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 really good yeah you basically decide where which plane is the action taking place on Keep your complexity mm-hmm. there and then simplify the other two planes. That's that's really yeah. good. Mine is you get eight major shapes mm. within a within a piece. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it can vary. But I mean, if you all of a sudden ha- it, it forces you, what it forces you to do is combine shapes mm-hmm. into groups. So, right. oh man, I got eight basic shapes, but I got a crowd scene. What am I supposed to do? Well, that crowd gets all a limited value and becomes yeah. one shape. Um, and mm-hmm. if you can limit it like that, it really simplifies your image. And if all of a sudden you got 12, 13, 14, you know, you can't simplify it. You start saying, okay, what, what can I get rid of? 
And mm-hmm. it's, it's an incredibly powerful way. I almost go, I'll, I'll, I don't draw the initial image that way. I draw it however I'm drawing, like, you know, just free mm-hmm. association thumbnailing. And then I look at, at that thumbnail through that lens. Okay, can mm-hmm. I make this into now eight shapes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, good. Do you, do you count the negative space as a shape? Absolutely. Okay. Because that's important, yeah. It's like a big thinking. jigsaw puzzle at the end. Right. I mean, almost, almost sort of like if you play with Jake's idea and my idea. My idea is flattening the whole thing, like almost like a jigsaw puzzle mm-hmm. that should fit together. Yeah, eight um, puzzle pieces. Yeah, and, and, and it's, what, it's it's amazing. I do I do that too, and I love playing with the the shapes, the negative shape. Like, and for anybody who doesn't know what I'm talking about, this think of sky or background areas that are more um, more plain. Like you would think, like if you if you illustrated a crowd and a building and a tree and a, and a car, you think of those as objects, and you say, "Well, I've got," and and I've grouped the 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 crowd together, so that's one shape. But you're forgetting about the background, the sky. That's a shape too, and right. that when you marry that with the the positive shapes, and you you make space. I it always bugs me when people have these weird just careless little tangencies with their their back their negative space and it's like i can tell i can look at their illustration right away and go oh you haven't learned that really important <laughs> lesson yet you know yeah. like you still have ways to go um and it's tough we should add the uh, like we said it's like it's we've given a lot of a lot of you're going to learn a lot of different things and you have to do all the things well for the piece to work and so you just approach each thing that you're struggling with right i mean mm-hmm. in terms of advice for how students are supposed to use it like i'm struggling with value well that's what you got to work on and then i'm struggling with composition it's kind of, kind of my analogy there would be like a golf swing there's like a hundred things you have to do right to have a perfect golf swing that's right you can't focus on a hundred things at once or a racquetball swing in in, in will's case but you can't <laughs> focus on all that so you focus on the one thing i'm gonna try to get more top spin it's that one thing you know yeah. and so maybe an easy way to handle all this stuff yeah and and don't beat yourself up you know look at what you did in the past i'm talking to people that entered the competition look at the the images you turned in and you know they're stepping stones to to better work so maybe pick three things that you're going to try to improve on and again look at the work that's winning look at the look at better work like jake said the the uh the truly master stuff and where where would you suggest people find really good illustration to look at these days because everything's online if people are looking at bad illustration as as their pinnacle <laughs> yeah how do, how do a tough one to get around how do how do because sometimes i look at I've, I've mentored students and i say well who are you looking at and i'm like <laughs> no don't why do you like this well you know <laughs> that's know. a rough one you what you could do is just go i mean you, you start with like a caldecott award and kind of work your way back there to see like mm-hmm. who was nominated for it. Go to their individual websites. Go through the years. You, could, you know, you for could for, for children's books and for public, you know, most of our students are pub- into publishing and children's books. Uh, there's the original art show. That is an original show that happens every year from published work in uh, at, at the Society of Illustrators in New York, and um, it's fantastic show. And it just shows all. It's a whole showcase of of a bunch of people doing stuff right. Can they see that online? Can they see the winners? I think they can. I'm not totally sure about that, but when in doubt, just go to Pinterest, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> type in, type in, I'm type in like Jake said. The, type in a call to cut winner and uh, and see what you get in in Pinterest. You should get some pretty good stuff. Yeah. So if you click on if you do original art show and images on Google, you can see quite a few pictures of people standing next to their art in the show. Oh, mm-hmm. nice. So have you guys gone to that show? I, I haven't. Have you been in the uh, show? I've been to I've some been shows, it. but not that show. I've been in it once. That's cool. Uh, it's yeah. fun, fun to do. We use it as a trip to go to New York if I'm in that show. Um, okay. That's, Are we done? That's about all that I have. And I, that's I'm good. Really, yeah, I'm really hoping to see, see this change because we do – you know, we get complaints like, why are you choosing the same people? And our, this is, it used to be easy when we had like Society of Illustrators annuals that everyone would get or CA annuals. And we would, we would get a book of the best art and the complaints there were the same. Why are the same people in there? And the answers are always, well, 
we want to put the best art in the book. And if it ends up being that it's the same people over and over again, so be it. We're not going to pick other people just to spread it around when it'll weaken the the end result. You yeah, know? no no trophies for everybody in this one. Right. You, you got to so earn it. It's harsh, but we want you guys to knock out the people that keep getting in there. No offense to the people that keep getting in there, but you need to be knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> I should add appro- approach the whole thing with a with a mentality of trying stuff out and don't get too locked in because then you can, you can fall victim to well I did all the things they said and I still didn't get in I, I mm-hmm. hate those people <laughs> I can't get mad because you're doing it all right it just means maybe the maybe the that mixture isn't right yet so you go yeah. back to the drawing board and try it again yeah I agree and I'm gonna I'm gonna take us out. Okay, sound good? Take us out. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. You can go there to get on the forum and see the announcements for Critique Arena. Uh, become a member of svslearn.com, and you can uh, join Critique Arena. Kind of throw your illustration into the ring. We'd love to love to see that. Um, so your hosts today have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker, and. You can find Lee White's uh, illustration at leewhiteillustration.com. You can find Will Terry's at willterry.com. And you can find mine at mrjakeparker.com. Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu. That's uh, danieltu.co for his website. And podcast and social media all handled by Lisa Fott. Special thanks to her for that. Now, if you like this episode, please share it around. Pass it on to your other friends who might be interested in illustration or want to get better. Um, if you haven't yet, subscribe to this podcast on whatever podcast catcher you use. Um, and, and if there's a, a place to leave a review, please leave a review. We love reading those and and uh, hearing what, what you all think about what we're doing here. Now, if you want to join in on this specific discussion, you have something to say about it. Uh, log on to sjslearn.com, go to the forums, free to join, free to be a member there. And what you'll see is a, uh, a post dedicated to this topic. And you can uh, chime in over there and, and let us know what you let us know your thoughts and what you think. All right, I think that's it. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>